I want to welcome you all um, to the Walls Lecture. Um, you would think with this being the first Wednesday that this would have been the first Walls Lecture, but actually we had a Walls Lecture on Monday. Um, so welcome to the second in the series. Um, our speaker today, uh, is Jeffrey Esco, is professor of cellular and molecular medicine and co-director of the Glycobiology Research and Training Center at the University of uh, California, San Diego. Am I doing something wrong? You are approaching me rapidly. Okay. And uh, it's still Dr. Jeffrey Esco who is going to be giving the talk. Um, this talk actually is almost two years in the making. Uh, from the time of the original invitation, the cancellation last year because of a hurricane, and of course today is the hottest day of the year, Jeff, so I don't know if we're trying to tell you something, but um, Dr. Esco received his PhD in biochemistry uh, from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, following an independent fellowship at the Molecular Biology Institute at UCLA, he moved to UAB, um, and then subsequently to the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at UC San Diego, um, and there he has helped to build uh, this uh, preeminent uh, program in glycobiology. Uh, work in his own lab, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, focuses on the structure, biosynthesis, and functions of proteoglycans. Uh, he has been a prolific scholar uh, publishing over 250 papers, reviews, and book chapters. Now, most of you probably know him as one of the editors and authors of the Essentials of Glycobiology text. This has really become the definitive textbook of, of glycobiology, and it's the thing that introduces uh, graduate students and medical students to, to the field. Um, He's past president of the Society for Glycobiology, and in his spare time, he helped co-found Zacharin Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. Um, his work has been recognized by the Carl Meyer Award, which is the highest honor uh, that the Society for Glycobiology uh, presents, and the IGO Award from the International Glycocongenie Organization. He is a merit awardee from NIH, uh, has some honorary degrees and recently was elected as a fellow of uh, the AAAS. Um, so to me, most importantly, uh, Jeff is known as a superb mentor. Um, he really has been intimately involved in the training of his students and postdocs and he really maintains a connection with them even after they leave the nest, so to speak. And I've, I've been the direct beneficiary of this, so thank you, Jeff. Uh, Tim Fritz, who did his PhD with Jeff, was a staff scientist in my group uh, for a number of very productive years uh, before uh, moving on to a, a more permanent position at the FDA. Um, I also ha uh, have it under very high authority that you, at least at one time in your life, made a mean deep dish pizza um, at the uh, reception following this, you should all question Jeff ab about that. Um, his, his lecture today entitled Proteoglycans, Arbiters of Lipoprotein Metabolism, will illuminate aspects of lipoprotein metabolism, structural functions underlying uh, uh, proteoglycan uh, biofunction, the role of syndicate 1 as a clearance receptor, and of course the general involvement of proteoglycans and atherosclerosis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeff Vesco. We on? Yeah. Thank you for that very kind introduction. One of the th I've learned a lot of stuff today. One of the things I've learned is that there's only two classes of people here who wear ties and they're either administrators or they're the seminar speaker. And so I'm the latter. Um, so the work I'm going to tell you about today was actually started a few years ago. And uh, there's been a number of students and postdoctoral fellows that have been involved in this. And I just want to quickly introduce them. It started with uh, Jennifer MacArthur, who um, went on to become a science writer. Rusty Bishop, who was a postdoc, um, is now a vice president of a company that he founded called Red Funnel. 
Yiping Dang, Kristen, Aaron, and John, all graduate students. Um, you see Kristen is at Harvard um, as a postdoc. Aaron Foley, who fortunately I had dinner with last night, is now at Georgetown Law. Um, and John is a postdoc um, looking for another position now. And Philip Gortz, who's a Belgian postdoc, very talented young man, um, who's really brought atherosclerosis into the laboratory. And of course, I want to acknowledge uh, sources of funding for this. Uh, they include a longstanding grant from the National Institutes of, of uh, General Medical Sciences. Uh, this particular grant, I believe, is now in its 30th year. Um, grants from uh, Heart and Lung, as well as training grants, and uh, we're participants in a liver cell tissue uh, distribution funded through the NIH. Um, a number of years ago, in fact, back in 1965, Donald Fredrickson, who some of you may know, um, came up with a classification scheme for the various types of uh, hyperlipidemias that occur in humans. And he used this as a, a mechanism for prediction of uh, the likelihood of coronary uh, vascular disease. And he categorized the different types of patients into these five categories, actually four categories, which has been subdivided. Um, and they are characterized by different accumulations of lipids, either uh, elevated cholesterol levels or triglycerides, or both triglycerides and cholesterol as shown here. And we now know the molecular basis for some of these disorders, that each of these classes are actually very heterogeneous. There's multiple uh, gene mutations that can give rise to this, but there's also multiple environmental factors that contribute to uh, these disorders. Now, this classification scheme um, has not been, is not in, in great use anymore, but it's still um, instructive in terms of considering the different classes of uh, diseases. Now, it turns out that in about 10% of the population actually suffers from hypertriglyceridemia. Um, that means 10% of the people in this room now have elevated triglycerides that exceed around 200 milligrams per deciliter in their blood but only a small fraction of the variation in plasma triglycerides are attributable to um, gene mutations in uh, single loci. And they include things like lipases and the docking sites for the lipase shown here, some of the proteins that are associated with the lipoprotein particles um, that contain the triglycerides and receptors like the LDL receptor that's involved in clearance. Uh, the vast majority of hypertriglyceridemia uh, is acquired and as a result or as a secondary complication of diabetes, of hypothyroidism, nephrotic syndrome, kidney transplant patients typically have elevated triglycerides, um, uh, changes in estrogen levels, obesity is one of the major contributors uh, to hypertriglyceridemia or vice versa, um, al excessive alcohol consumption, um, as well as a side effect of many types of drugs. In fact, the most common secondary effect of of most drug treatment, of many drug treatments, is um, transient hypertriglyceridemia that resolves once the patient's removed from um, therapy. What's not clear is what the molecular basis is for these acquired forms of hypertriglyceridemia. Now, today, what I'm going to do is break my talk up into a couple of different sections. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about glycobiology just in general. That is a form of post-translational modification. It's familiar to many of you. Um, and specifically, I'll focus on proteoglycans, which may be less familiar. I'll also give a, a short introduction about lipoprotein metabolism so you can see how these two things are connected. And then, as Larry said, I'll show you that syndican 1, which is a specific type of transmembrane proteoglycan, mediates the hepatic clearance of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Um, from the circulation. And I'll show you that the binding depends on specific proteins on those particles called ApoE and ApoA5. And I'll show you that, in fact, clearance through this receptor is atheroprotective. And then with the remaining time, I'm going to just give you kind of a view of a couple other proteoglycans that we've described now um, that are involved in um, regulating either atherosclerosis or, or preventing it or um, changing uh, the way that lipoproteins are handled. Now, all cells are covered with a thick, thick layer called the glycocalyx, and it's shown here is an electron micrograph of a cell of a lymphocyte that's been stained with ruthenium, and you can see that this layer surrounds the entire plasma membrane, and to give you an idea of the dimensions here, this is about 50 nanometers thick, or about 10 times the thickness of the underlying plasma membrane. All cells are covered with a glycocalyx. In fact, all cells in biology 
in nature are covered with a glycocalyx. I know of no cell that can't make, that doesn't make a glycocalyx of some type. And in fact, gene knockouts of various um, steps involved in the assembly of these things are generally incompatible with life. Um, these glycocalyxes can be found in endothelial cells and, uh, as I said, all other cells. And in fa fact, in some cases, it can be extremely thick. And here, this is a particular fixation method where it kind of pulls the strands of the, of the polysaccharides out from the surface of the cell. Um, the actual endothelial cell layer is shown here, and so you can see the glycocalyx is actually thicker than the cell itself. Now, various artists have rendered the glycocalyx in different forms. Here's a picture of a red blood cell that was um, drawn back in 1985. And the glycoproteins and glycolipids are shown embedded in the plasma membrane of the cell. And these extended green structures are supposed to be the sugar chains that come up from those um, uh, macromolecules. The tips are decorated here to indicate sialic acid residues uh, on the ends of these chains. Uh, this cover of Science Magazine that came out in 2001 uh, the artist um, uh, took the liberty of rendering these chains in, in the following ways, uh, as though these represented individual atoms of the carbohydrates. Now, if you were to fly over a cell at, let's say, 20,000 feet, what you would see is that the glycocalyx really kind of looks like a forest canopy or a kelp bed, for example, where uh, the oligosaccharides might be these branches extending up from the proteins and glycolipids that are down at the base here embedded in the earth. Um, and these uh, green things are the terminal sugars um, on the various types of glycans. If you take a closer look at the glycocalyx, what you find is that it's actually composed of numerous types of glycoconjugates. And so many of these are familiar to you. They include glycoproteins, which typically contain uh, branched oligosaccharide chains that are attached to asparagine residues. But of course, there are other types of glycans like the ones that Larry and, and Kelly work on and which are attached to serine and threonine residues within the core protein. Now, we use a symbol nomenclature to represent the individual sugars because if I drew these out in their chemical structures, they would obscure some of the complexity that exists here um, and the information content. And this color coding geometric symbols are shown here. And the only thing that's important for this discussion is to realize that the different colors and the different symbols represent chemical structures that distribute functionalities and chemical functionalities in space. And what's happened is that um, through evolution, a number of proteins have evolved that can dock with these um, structures, often in very specific uh, ways with specific arrangements of the sugar residues. There are also glycosphingolipids. These contain short sometimes branched oligosaccharides that are attached to lipids that are just in the outer leaflet of the membrane and don't span the membrane. And there's glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol linked proteins that contain a short glycan as a linker between the lipid moiety and the protein itself, as shown here. About 85% of, of all the proteins that are secreted by cells or that are present on the cell surface are estimated to contain this post type of post-translational modification. Now shown center stage here are the proteoglycans. And the proteoglycans have characteristic carbohydrate chains called glycosaminoglycans, or GAGs for short. And these GAG chains consist of repeat structures um, that are based on two sugars called N-acetylglucosamine and glucuronic acid. And they repeat many times. And this underestimates the length of these chains. These things can be 200 sugar residues long. You'll notice, too, that they're um, decorated with sulfate groups indicated by the S, and I'll come back to that in a moment, because that's, to a large extent, the business end of, of these chains. All these molecules are synthesized in the ER Golgi system and secreted from the cell. The exception to that, are, is one of the exceptions, is a polymer called hyaluronin or hyaluronic acid. This is actually made at the plasma membrane by a synthase, or there's a small family of synthases that can do this. And as the polymer is being extended, it extrudes from the cell like squeezing toothpaste out of a tube. These polymers can be extremely long. They can be 10,000 sugar residues long. And they are heavily hydrated, and they form the hydrated part of the hydrated matrix um, that surrounds cells. Um, although we normally talk about most glycosylation this way, most of you know that, in fact, um, 
a number of nuclear and cytoplasmic proteins can under, undergo uh, the addition of a single sugar residue to serine or threonine residues. And John Hanover obviously works on this in Jerry Hart's group. Um, this is probably the most prominent form of glycosylation in terms of the number of proteins that can undergo this type of modification. Um, but it's in fact received the least attention, at least until um, uh, the, re the last decade or so. So these are the various players here, and what I'm going to concentrate on are just the proteoglycans. There are two major types of gag chains that are found. There are the heparin sulfate chains and chondroitin sulfate. There's a derivative of this called dermatan, which I'm not going to talk about. And heparin sulfate is related in structure to heparin, the anticoagulant. In fact, heparin is a fractionated form of heparin sulfate that has certain properties that um, make it an excellent uh, antithrombotic agent. Now, it turns out that there's not that large of a family of heparin sulfate proteoglycans. So it's very different than glycoproteins, where there are literally hundreds and hundreds of glycoproteins. There's probably less than 20 heparin sulfate proteoglycans. Some of these are transmembrane uh, proteoglycans, and they include uh, four members of the syndican family, uh, a splice form of CD44, CD47, a beta-glycan, and neuropilin-1. And all of these have either single transmembrane passes, or in the case of CD47, as I learned today, is a polytopic protein that can span the membrane several times. Um, there are six members of the glipocan family. These are linked to the outer surface of the cell by way of a GPI anchor. And then there's four members that are secreted, and these are the matrix proteoglycans, called perlican, agrin, collagen 18, and serglycin, which is actually found in the granules of hematopoietic cells but can be secreted by cells, by different cells um, under pr appropriate stimulation. Now, if you look at one of these chains in a little bit more detail, we can learn more about the biological function of the heparin sulfate chains. These chains are always assembled on a core protein, and the formation of these things is catalyzed by a series of glycosyl transferases that add single sugar residues one at a time going from this end of the polymer to this end of the polymer. During the assembly process, a uh, number of processing enzymes act to introduce sulfate groups at various positions along the chain, um, and an epimerase can flip the stereochemistry of this sugar to this sugar. The generation of these sulfated, resid uh, sulfated regions is under a control mechanism that we don't fully understand, but turns out to be a heritable trait of cells. So if you look at fibroblasts or if you look at endothelial cells, what you find is different um, frequencies of clusters like this that are stably expressed by that particular cell type. It turns out that the arrangements of these sulfated regions is also dictated by mechanisms that we don't understand, where the size of them, as well as their spacing, again occurs in a tissue-specific, cell-specific manner. Now, it turns out that these uh, sulfated regions are the binding sites for various proteins. And the way to think about this is just like any other type of, of molecular interaction. What the sulfate groups do is just position negative charge in space. And by attaching them to different positions on these sugars, it orients those sulfate groups spatially in a very uh, specific patterns. Um, those patterns can make up binding sites, and so in fact, shown here is a pentasaccharide that has a very specific arrangement of sulfate groups, and this makes up the high affinity binding site for antithrombin-3. And in fact, this is the active moiety within heparin that facilitates the ability of antithrombin to inactivate thrombin in factor uh, 10. Other types of binding sequences are shown here. This is the F, uh, a binding sequence that can interact with the FGF receptor and FGF. And in fact, a whole plethora of different growth factors are known to interact with different sulfated sequ sequences within the chains. Many ligands are dimeric, for example, the chemokines, and they will contain two of these domains that can dock with these sulfated regions. Uh, it's often on opposite sides of the dimer. And so the spacing of these sulfated residues regions all becomes important in terms of dictating their biological function. Proteoglycans do many things. Even though they're very few in, in number, they can facilitate signaling events. So for example, they can facilitate binding of a ligand to its receptor, in this case FGF, FGF receptors. 
Um, that can occur in cis or in trans configurations across cells. And the process of, or the, the function of the heparin sulfate chain is actually to facilitate the formation of the complexes um, and to increase their duration on the cell surface. Um, they can also participate in the presentation of ligands, for example, chemokines to seven transmembrane receptors on adjacent cells. Um, cell surface proteoglycans can bind to extracellular matrix proteins and facilitate cell adhesion and cell spreading because many of these proteoglycans dock with elements of the cytoskeleton, either directly or through adapter proteins. And proteoglycans that are present in the matrix actually helps organize the matrix, either into a fibrous matrix like it's found under the connective tissue cells or the basement membrane structures that underlie epithelium. These molecules are dynamic. They can be proteolytically processed by matrix metalloproteases and shed, where they'll become elements of the extracellular matrix. And then there's an enzyme called heparanase that can clip these chains and liberate bound factors. They can also be internalized by endocytosis. This is not a clathrin-mediated pathway. This is probably macropinocytosis. Um, it's calvulin-independent, but it seems to be lipid raft-dependent, whatever that means. But the important thing is that cargo bound to the heparin sulfate chains is internalized with the proteoglycan and directed to the lysosome, where it's subsequently degraded, both the cargo as well as the proteoglycan. And we know the degradation process is very important because there's a class of lysosomal storage diseases called the mucopolysaccharidoses, in which individual enzymes involved in the degradation of the heparin sulfate chain are, met, are, are missing. And this leads to all kinds of uh, problems for the kids that are afflicted. Now, in the case of lipoproteins, I need to tell you a little bit about um, the background to this project. So when we eat, the major form of lipid that's present in our diet is triglycerides. These triglycerides are insoluble in water, and so um, what has evolved is a system for carrying these triglycerides in the circulation by way of lipoprotein particles. And these are just particles in which the neutral triglycerides and cholesterol esters, which are insoluble, are trapped in, in the interior of these particles, which is covered by a monolayer of phospholipid. And so it renders this whole thing soluble. And then embedded in the lipoprotein are various apolipoproteins, or enzymes that can um, act on the various lipid uh, species there. Um, after a meal, within a very short period of time, you'll start to see uh, uh, appearance of very large particles in the circulation called chylomicrons. They're micron-sized particles, and they scatter light, and so immediately after a meal, the blood becomes cloudy. The liver also produces triglycerides and packages them in a different type of lipoprotein particle called VLDL, or very low-density lipoprotein. And these two, protein, uh, these two types of lipoproteins enter the circulation and are acted on by an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. It was once thought that lipase was, in, uh, was tethered to the endothelial surface by way of a proteoglycan. But data from Steve Young's lab show that, in fact, there's a specific receptor called GPIHBP1 that's embedded in the uh, luminal side of the endothelial cells that binds to the lipase, which actually originates in the parenchymal tissue, diffuses over to the endothelium, and then that GPIHBP1 acts as a transporter to move the lipase to the opposite side, to the luminal side of the capillary. The lipase somehow gains access to the interior of the particle, hydrolyzes much of the triglyceride, which is then taken up as free fatty acids to be used for energy production in the heart or for um, muscle contraction during exercise um, or for milk production in the mammary gland or for deposition as adipose tissue. What's left after these uh, particles are acted on are what are called remnant particles, and they include the chylomicron remnants and the VLDL remnants. These have different densities now because of the change in lipid to protein ratios. And some of these can be acted on by other exchange proteins present in the plasma to generate LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, which is the major cholesterol carrier. These particles, and at least half of the LDL particles that are generated, are all cleared in the liver by way of receptor systems. So as these lipoproteins pass through the sinusoids of the, of the liver, they encounter a specialized endothelium that's gapped or fenestrated. If you look by uh, transmission EM, you can see the openings in the endothelial layer, shown here. 
And then as particles pass through that opening, they enter what's called the space of Dissé, I think is the proper way to pronounce that. And they encounter the basal membrane of the hepatocyte. And that basal membrane has microvilli that stick up that greatly increase the surface area of this. And this is where all the various receptors are located for clearing all sorts of things from the plasma. The system's well orchestrated. Newly made particles are too big to get through the fenestry, and so they tend to circulate. And until the lipase acts on them and delivering the free fatty acids to peripheral tissues, um, once it, that happens, then the particles are reduced in size, and they now can fit through these openings. When they come into this space, um, they can be recognized by a, a few different receptors. Originally, it was thought that perhaps the LDL receptor described by Brown and Goldstein um, might be involved in the clearance of these TRL particles. But patients that are missing the LDL receptor, FH homozygotes, um, certain types of rabbits, the Watanabe rabbit, um, and mice that have mutations in the LDL receptor, actually don't get very um, frank uh, hypertriglyceridemia. What they do accumulate is cholesterol in the blood due to the inability to clear LDL um, from the plasma. That led Joachim Hertz to um, look at another class of receptors, or he discovered another class of receptors called the low-density lipoprotein-related proteins, um, low-density lipoprotein-receptor-related proteins. Um, these two can bind um, uh, TRLs, uh, these triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and potentially mediate their clearance. But when that receptor or the ones that are expressed in the liver are knocked out, in fact, it doesn't cause hypertriglyceridemia. And even if you compound mutations in both of these receptors, one doesn't get any greater accumulation of lipids than what one sees when you just knock out the LDL receptor. So that suggested that there had to be a third class of receptors. And what I'll show you is that that third class of receptors is a specific proteoglycan called Syndican 1. Now, there was already hints that, in fact, proteoglycans were involved in the system when we started our work. It was known that a number of proteins involved in lipid metabolism, APOE, APOB, the two of the lipases, lipoprotein lipase and hepatic lipase, all can bind to heparin. Uh, it wasn't clear it binds to heparin sulfate, but it binds to heparin. Marilyn Farquhar had shown a number of years ago that if she used an antibody against one of the core proteins of proteoglycans, she could decorate the space of DSA, as shown here. And here's a blow up here. And you can see that, in fact, it's lighting up right around the, um, uh, the microvilli. And finally, Bob Maley's group, I think, did the most definitive experiment. What he did was he actually infused animals with, um, uh, um, with a lipoprotein particle preparation. Um, and then he asked about clearance from the plasma. And he measured that both in the absence and after perfusion of the organ with heparinase. This is a bacterial enzyme that can cleave the chain up into pieces. And so it removes heparin sulfate from the liver, from all points in the liver. And what he found was that, in fact, um, after heparinase treatment, the amount of lipid remaining in the plasma went up compared to um, uh, the untreated animals. And the amount that was cleared in the liver went down which really suggested that proteoglycans somehow were involved in the clearance mechanism, but it wasn't exactly clear how. So when we got into the system, we took a look at the various family members of the proteoglycans, and we began to either make mutants or gather up mutants that other groups had generated. It turns out that in the liver, there's only a limited set of proteoglycans expressed. They include three members of the syndican family. These are the single pass proteoglycans two of the glipocans, and three of the secreted matrix proteoglycans shown here. So Kristen Stanford, when she was a um, graduate student in the lab, <clears throat> just measured plasma triglycerides. And what she found was that, in fact, the only animals that accumulated plasma triglycerides were um, animals that had a systemic deletion in syndican 1, whereas other mutations, uh, mutations of other proteoglycans uh, didn't have that phenotype. Now, this is under fasting conditions. And so under those conditions, all the dietary lipids have already been cleared from the circulation. And what you're looking at is the accumulation of lipids that are derived from the liver. So we wanted to know if, in fact, this was true for dietary lipids. To do that, we do a different kind of experiment, a postprandial clearance experiment. 
And here what we do is we orally gavage the mice with a bolus of triglyceride, actually corn oil, <clears throat> that's been mixed with tritiated retinol. That tritiated retinol is converted in the gut into retinol esters, and the retinol esters are packaged along with the triglyceride inside lipoprotein particles, inside the chylomicron particles. The only way to clear the tritiated retinol esters is through the liver, so it's not acted on by the lipase in the circulation. So we do periodic eye bleeds and measure both the amount of tritiated retinol ester and triglyceride present in the plasma. And so this is an excursion curve for the, for the lipids. And you see that during gastric emptying, the plasma levels of, of, of the tritiated retinol esters go up, and then it eventually clears. This is actually um, underestimating the clearance rate because there is some recycling that takes place um, once uh, the material is removed in the liver. The important thing is, is that when you look at the Syndican 1 knockout mouse, you see that it overaccumulates this material, and then eventually it clears. And if you take the four-hour time point and actually measure triglyceride levels after this bolus feeding, you can see it's elevated in the mutant as well. Next, the prediction from this is that Syndican 1 should be located um, in the appropriate location um, in order to mediate clearance. If you take an antibody, um, this was raised by Merck Bernfield's group against the mouse syndican 1, it, light, it lights up the sinusoids of the liver by um, a, a immunohistochemistry shown here. Here's the control showing that there's no reactivity. And then Marilyn Farquhar was able to conjugate this antibody to gold particles, and we showed that in fact it decorates the space of DSA as expected. And if you look at the magnification down here, you can see that all the gold particles are sitting right on top of the microvilli, which is what you'd expect if this receptor is going to clear the lipoprotein particles. Now, the Syndican 1 knockout mouse is a, is a conventional knockout, so it's systemic. So we wanted to prove that it was really hepatic uh, Syndican 1 that was important. And so the way we did this is to knock the gene back into the liver using adenovirus. And shown here is the excursion curves, again, using a tritiated retinol tracer. That's the wild type here. If we use Syndican, um, if we take an adenovirus that contains um, uh, GFP and inject it into the Syndican 1 deficient mouse, we get the mutant phenotype as shown here. But if we use an adenovirus that contains full length Syndican 1, you can see we restore clearance to normal levels. So that told us that it was hepatic Syndican 1 that was important in the system. Now, Syndican 1 is a very interesting proteoglycan. It has three different heparin sulfate attachment sites. It has a couple of attachment sites for chondroitin sulfate that are located close to the membrane. There's a proteolytic cleavage site that's membrane proximal here. It has a single transmembrane pass, and it has a short cytoplasmic tail that's thought to interact with a number of different adapter proteins. You can imagine that if, if this is going to function as a receptor now, the issue became does the lipoprotein bind with the core protein, which I've underestimated in, in size here, um, or does it interact with the heparin sulfate chains? And to get at that question, we took advantage of a number of conditional knockouts that my group has made that are defective, that, have, um, that are um, locks P-flank alleles of enzymes that are involved in addition of sulfate groups along the chain. And so we have mutations that affect this one, one of the genes that's involved in putting that sulfate group on, and one of the genes that's involved in putting that group on. And then Kristen knocked this, uh, these genes out in the liver using albumin Cree driver, which turns on um, uh, at about 10 days of development, uh, 10 days post, uh, of, uh, postpartum. And what she found was that under fasting conditions, um, both the NDST1 and the HS2ST mice accumulated plasma triglycerides relative to the wild type, whereas the 6ST mutation did not, which told us that it was sulfate groups that were located in these positions along the chain that were important. We don't know if there's a specific arrangement or sequence of sulfated um, uh, residues that, um, like sh that shown here that's in involved in this process yet, uh, but that's a future study. So we wanted to then ask the question, since multiple proteoglycans are expressed in the liver, is Syndican 1 the only one that, that's important here? The Syndican 1 knockout was systemic, but we could crossbreed this into our conditional knockout that has a T1 
tissue specific or hepatocyte specific deletion of one of these sulfotransferases that's important. And so you could ask the question, does that lead to an additive effect or, in, or not? And it turns out that when you look at the plasma lipids, that the double mutant has the same level of plasma lipids as the two single mutants, which tells us that two things. One, it was the heparin sulfate chain specifically on Syndican 1, and it told us that Syndican 1 was the only proteoglycan in the liver that was actually mediating this process. And so we didn't need to make mutants in all the other proteoglycans. We confirmed this result using postprandial in a postprandial experiment with the tritiated retinol. Here's the standard excursion curve. If you look at the single mutants, they're behaving like this. And if you look at the double mutant, it behaves just like the single mutants. And so that really says that both dietary derived as well as liver derived lipoproteins are using Syndican 1 as the only um, proteoglycan receptor in the liver. So just to show you then our model is, is that the proteoglycan somehow docks with the lipoprotein particle. And if you just go through some calculations here, this is a very interesting uh, concept because most binding proteins that interact with heparin sulfate actually dock by way of sequences that are somewhere between eight and usually 12 sugar residues long. But if you look at the size, the dimension of the particle, the particle's massive relative to the size of these docking sites. It's about the same size as the length of the whole chain. And so our model for this is that somehow the chains wrap themselves around these particles and dock with perhaps multiple ligands within the lipoprotein particle. So the next part of this study was to try to identify what the proteins are in the particles that actually form the docking site uh, to this uh, receptor. There were several possible um, <clears throat> candidates for, the, for this based on the ability of all these proteins to bind to heparin. Um, and so they included ApoE, Apo2, the um, two isoforms of ApoB, ApoA5, and two of the lipases. These all have different sizes. The ratios per particle is known for several of these, and in a couple cases it was unknown. And in some cases it's known. For example, ApoE is a ligand for LDLR in one of the LRPs, but it's unknown whether in fact it would play a role in uh, binding to the proteoglycans. So John Gonzalez in the lab, uh, when he was a graduate student, uh, decided to look at this problem, and he just reasoned that, in fact, if we have three different receptors that can potentially be involved in clearance here, that if you knock out any one receptor or pair of receptors, what you should do is you should get accumulation of the particles that would normally be cleared by that receptor, a very simple concept. And so he isolated the plasma lipoproteins from Syndican 1 knockout mice, um, and then he fractionated them. And what he found was that, in fact, the animals that have mutations either in Syndican 1 or in the sulfotransferases um, that affect the uh, chain quality on Syndican 1, that what you find is that there was no prevalent or no striking accumulation of any of the ApoB isoforms, but in fact, he saw a consistent increase in ApoE. Now, for the rest of the studies I'm going to show you, we used what's called, uh, what we call the NDST1 elb Cree mice. And wherever there's a plus sign means that it was Cree positive. And our control here is the flox allele without the Cree gene. And so in the mutant, you can see ApoE accumulating. You also see ApoCs accumulation, accumulating as well, which I think is a whole other um, aspect of this story. But none, none of the ApoCs bind to heparin, and so we haven't studied those in any details um, as yet, but uh, they're currently uh, being pursued. So let me show you what happens now. So John worked out a series of very clever assays to assess whether specific apolipoproteins or other proteins might be involved in this process. So one thing he did is he knew that from our postprandial studies that he could make radioactive lipoproteins by feeding the animals tritiated retinol. So he could purify those particles from a mouse and then ask if they bind to a hepatocyte. And in this case, he used HEP3B, which is a human hepatoma line that expresses high levels of Syndican 1. And what he found was that he got robust binding to the cell surface. Now, I point out that you can, uh, based on the, on the radioactivity and uh, mass measurements, we knew that the cells were binding somewhere around um, three and a half micrograms of uh, the lipoprotein per milligram cell protein. 
And if we translate that based on, on the size of the particles and densities of things, it turns out that that translates to about 2 million receptors per cell. That's a very high number. LDL receptors are present at around 20,000 copies per cell under induced conditions. And under normal conditions, it may be lower than that. So these are very abundant receptors present on the, lipo on the hepatocyte surface. If you treat the cells with heparin lyase, because we don't have mutants of the hepatoma line, what you see is, is, is a reduction in the level of binding of the lipoprotein. He then isolated these particles from an APOE knockout mouse, which is available, and he uh, took those particles, and when he challenged them to bind to the hepatoma cells, what he saw was there was greatly reduced binding, and the residual binding now was not sensitive to heparin, heparin AIDS treatment. So this residual binding is presumably other receptors, like the LDL receptor or LRP1 um, that's present on the uh, hepatocyte cell surface. So most of the binding is actually mediated by the proteoglycan, which makes, makes it the major receptor. He wanted to prove there was really APOE that was uh, responsible for this, and so he could take these particles <clears throat> from the APOE knockout mouse and reconstitute it with recombinant APOE. And when he does that experiment, he can restore binding, and he restores heparinase sensitivity um, to the interaction as well. So that was the first case that established, or two pieces of evidence that established that APOE was involved. He also developed a flotation assay in which we take the ectodomain of Syndican 1, which I'll show you how we prepare in a moment, um, and he mixes it with the human triglyceride-rich lipoproteins that he can isolate from, patient, uh, from uh, donors. And when um, the lipoprotein particles are very buoyant, and so they will float if you centrifuge the plasma, um, uh, and they float at a density of, of less than 1063 grams per mil. The proteoglycans are very dense because carbohydrates are very dense, and the protein core is density of like 1.33. So if you mix these two and these two interact, then we would predict that a certain number of these ectodomains would bind and now float up to the top of the tube. And in fact, it required us to adjust the density of the medium to slightly higher values because now the composite density of the, lipo, of the lipoprotein proteoglycan complex is greater than the 1063. So at 102 grams per mil, you now float up a fraction of the material. We actually generate those ectodomains by taking advantage of that cleavage site, and if we activate hepatoma cells with um, 4 bulmeristic acid, we turn on that matrix metalloprotease. It clips off this ectodomain, which we can then isolate um, um, in radioactive form or in chemical forms from the cells, as shown here in this dot plot. So here's the experiment. We use increasing amounts of human um, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and we titered the amount of counts that we can bring up to the top of the tube, and you can see that it shows saturability, and under these conditions, around 30 to 40 percent of the counts come up. And so there's, uh, this is fractionating those proteoglycans, which is another story unto itself in terms of the heterogeneity of the material. If you do this incubation in the presence of heparin, we block the interaction. If you now take a monoclonal antibody to APOE and add it to the uh, mixture, it now prevents the fl uh, flotation of the counts, whereas a pre-immune mouse IgG match, isotype matched IgG um, has no effect in the system. So that was the third criteria for establishing that APOE is involved in this um, process. So we wanted to finally just put the nail in the coffin and look genetically to see if this was true. I showed you before that this mutant accumulates plasma triglycerides relative to the wild type. If you look at the APOE knockout mouse, it also accumulates plasma triglycerides, as shown here. And so the prediction was is that the double mutant should not show additivity. But in fact, when we did that experiment, it did show additivity. And in fact, we were getting greater um, levels of accumulation of triglycerides in the double mutant now than in either the single mutants. That suggested that there probably was a second ligand that was involved in binding to the proteoglycan. Another way to establish this was to take those tritiated uh, lipoprotein particles and inject them back into a mouse and watch what happens. If you inject wild-type um, particles back into a wild-type mouse, they're cleared very rapidly in the liver with a T1 half of around three and a half minutes. If you inject those particles into a mouse that has this NDST1 deficiency, 
that is the proteoglycans are reduced in sulfation in the liver, you can see that the particles clear very poorly, again establishing the proteoglycan as being a dominant clearance receptor uh, under these conditions. The important thing was is that when we took the APOE deficient particles and injected them into a wild type, we didn't get a curve that looked like this, we got a curve that was intermediate, which meant that these were being cleared now, continually, presumably cleared by the, um, by the um, proteoglycan receptor. And in fact, if we injected those particles into the proteoglycan deficient mouse, we got the same clearance curve as when they were um, wild type particles were injected. So this difference here told us that there had to be another ligand in the system. So we went to, on a search for this other ligand. By Kamasi or by uh, silver staining, we couldn't see anything other than these APOC um, uh, uh, um, lipo, uh, apolipoproteins. We developed antibodies against murine lipoprotein lipase and hepatic lipase. They reacted very well with tissue-derived enzymes, but when we looked on, on the particles, we didn't see any of these proteins present there. But a monoclonal antibody against ApoA5, another apolipoprotein, lit up in the mutant compared to the wild type. And when we did a large number of animals, we got an average value of about a sevenfold accumulation of this apolipoprotein in the mutant compared to the wild type. So just to prove that that was important, we went, John went back to the flotation assay. Here's the control mouse IgG. If he injects or if he adds anti-APOA5, it blocks the flotation, indicating that A5 was important in the system. And the interesting finding was that if, in fact, you injected APOE uh, antibodies, it also reduced binding almost to, this, or to the same extent as the anti-A5 antibody, which meant that the proteoglycans were, binding, were required to bind both the E and the A5 on the particles. He took that one step further. What we had been working with are proteoglycans, so these elute in the void volume of a gel filtration column. But if you treat this under um, alkaline conditions, you can actually remove these carbohydrate chains from the protein core and then fractionate these. And if you take now these S35 labeled chains and challenge them to bind to the lipoproteins, in fact, they bind just as well as the native um, proteoglycan is shown here, and it shows the same sensitivity to heparin inhibition um, in the flotation assay. We then used our monoclonal antibodies in the flotation assay, and what we showed was that, in fact, though we can float the materials normally under these conditions um, with a pre-immune IgG, if you now use anti-APOE or anti-A5, we prevent the interaction. So not only do you have to have docking with both ligands, but it's, in fact, a single chain has binding sites for both of these ligands. So what I've shown you is that hepatocyte syndicate 1 proteoglycan is a major remnant lipoprotein receptor in mice. The heparin sulfate chains make up the lipoprotein binding site, based on our genetic analysis, and that docking depends on multivalent interactions with APOE and APOA5. We can't do the genetic experiment with A A5 knockout mice because A5 is also involved in the lipolysis of the particles in the peripheral circulation. And so it gives you a confusing result. So I think to come back to what I started with, I told you that um, uh, hypertriglyceridema is a very common uh, ailment. And these studies raise the possibility that alterations of syndican 1 or heparin sulfate formation could contribute to hypertriglyceridemia. Um, a number of sh studies show that, in fact, hypertriglyceridemia is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease as well. And so what I want to conclude with now is our studies are, are a, a couple of other studies that indicate the importance of the proteoglycans, um, of other proteoglycans in the system. Um, in atherosclerosis, um, is a process in which lipoproteins become deposited in the intimal layer of the arteries, um, and then um, that causes an inflammatory response, and you get macrophage infiltration um, into the tissues. These macrophages eat the deposited lipoprotein particles and convert into foam cells, which eventually will form a, like a lipid gruel that forms the um, a core of the atherosclerotic plaque. This can rupture 
leading to um, thrombotic effects in the circulation. We are in a great position now to ask, using our mutant mice, whether in fact clearance of triglyceride through the um, syndican receptors might be important in this process. And so Philip Gortz in the lab uh, took these animals and he had to place them on an APOE deficient background in order to induce atherosclerosis because mice don't develop atherosclerosis spontaneously. Um, these animals, now if you take the aortas out and cut them longitudinally and open them up and then stain with oil red O, you can see that in fact the mutant that lacks uh, the sulfotransferase accumulates lots of oil red O positive plaques. And when we quantitate the plaque area or plaque volume by doing sections through this, you can see that in fact atherosclerosis is greatly elevated in the absence of the clearance receptor. And this is the first data really demonstrating that in fact hypertriglyceridemia um, can potentiate the format, uh, formation of atherosclerotic lesions. And so syndican one in this system is atheroprotective. So the kinds of studies that we're doing now to address, uh, to further address this is we're doing structure function studies of syndican one. Remember we can knock the gene back into the liver and so we're making mutants of syndican one lacking um, the attachment sites. We'd like to know what makes hepatic syndican one unique. Syndican one is expressed in other tissues, yet it only seems to be functional within the, in terms of clearance, in terms of uh, in the liver. We want to know where the binding sites for the heparin sulfate are in APOE and A5. It's been potentially mapped in APOE, but A5 was still a little confusing. Um, we want to know if syndican one expression is regulated. And in fact, there is indirect data in the literature suggesting that certain things like omega-3 fatty acids will regulate the expression of this receptor. Um, we'd like to know if the remnant receptors are coordinated in action. And so we just published a couple weeks ago a paper using all the double and the triple knockouts now of all three receptors, showing that uh, the importance of the um, heparin sulfate proteoglycan receptor that works independently but in parallel to the LDL receptor in the system. Um, we'd like to know if variation in syndican 1 expression or heparin sulfate composition in humans explains idiopathic forms of hypertriglyceridemia. And there was a paper that appeared uh, uh, about two years ago now uh, from Maley's group showing that, in fact, a uh, Turkish population that has um, hypertriglyceridemia has SNPs located within the epimerase gene, within the um, coding sequence. That's the enzyme that flips the stereochemistry of one of the sugars. Um, and he showed that, in fact, the epimerase knockout mouse also accumulates um, triglycerides. So that's the first evidence that, in fact, this receptor might be important in humans as well. Um, and then finally, I have to end with is the question is the whether proteoglycans mediate metabolism of lipoproteins in other tissues. And just in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to tell you about another story that has to do with collagen 18. We looked at the secreted proteoglycans in the system. This is work done by Rusty Bishop, and Rusty showed that collagen 18 knockout mice also accumulate plasma triglycerides. We uh, have conditional knockouts in perlican and agarin. These do not accumulate plasma lipids. Turns out there's a human uh, uh, syndrome called Noblock syndrome in which there are mutations in the human type collagen 18 gene, and there's a consanguineous family that was identified in Brazil with a defect and a three prime splice site of intron one. Um, and it turns out that um, that generates a splice form, uh, a short form that's um, um, present in epithelial and endothelial basement membranes and patients lack that. But they still make the long form which is expressed prominently in the liver. So the fact that these animals, that the animals accumulate plasma triglycerides suggested the possibility that perhaps these patients might as well. <clears throat> And so uh, I sent Rusty down to Brazil. He met up with our collaborator, Rita Paso Bueno. Um, and Rita and Rusty got in a car and drove about three hours into the back, back lands of Brazil to meet up with this family who were uh, very obliging and allowed us, and um, fasted, and then allowed us to do blood draws on all the uh, family members. Some of these are heterozygotes, some are homozygotes, and some of them are, are wild type. That's Rusty shown there. And when we measured their plasma triglycerides, we saw that they were elevated in the homozygous nulls, but not in the heterozygotes or in the wild type. This is um, and 
as large of an N as we can possibly get in this system. And you can see the phenotype is the same as in the mouse. And it turns out that the deficiency, um, oh, I want to point out that because these um, uh, patients have the normal um, splice form of collagen 18 in the liver, that the defect has to be extrahepatic that causes this hyperlipidemia. And we tracked it down to a deficiency in the lipoprotein lipase that's available in the plasma compartment for hydrolyzing the plasma lipids in the system. Um, this is an experiment in which we injected animals with heparin. Heparin releases the endogenous stores. They make normal amounts of the enzyme. They just can't put it out into the lumen of the um, vasculature. Um, and it turns out that when you look in the no block patients, they also have reduced levels of plasma lipoprotein lipase. And so this is an example now of another proteoglycan. This one's located in basement membranes that are surrounding the vasculature. And that the enzyme, which is made in the parenchymal tissue, somehow uses this proteoglycan uh, in order to get out to the cell surface. Uh, we know that the GPIHBB1 receptor is involved in that process, and we're currently trying to figure out how the proteoglycan collaborates with that receptor uh, to mediate the transfer. And finally, some very recent studies, which were just um, recently submitted to uh, cell metabolism, um, we've crossed uh, our sulfotransferase knockout into a lysem Cree background in order to inactivate the sulfotransferase in macrophages or in the myeloid lineage. And it, we, it turns out that these mice develop atherosclerosis um, um, in a striking way compared to the controls, and it's quantitated here in terms of lesion area. It's also true if you measure the lesion volume. It turns out that the, we don't know exactly which proteoglycan is active in this system, but the, it turns out that it has nothing to do with clearance or uptake of lipoprotein um, by the macrophages, but has to do with um, tempering an inflammatory response uh, to type 1 interferon stimulation in the system. So it's another role for proteoglycans um, in lipoprotein clearance. So I won't go back through this again. These are the kinds of areas that we're interested in. Obviously, proteoglycans mediate metabolisms in, in, of lipoproteins in many different types of contexts, and uh, we're cur currently pursuing that um, in different ways. And so I'll stop there, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, so we have time for questions. If you can use the mic so that the people who are on the webcast can hear. John? So Jeff's very nice. Um, I'm wondering to what extent the heterogeneity in sulfation and in chain link contribute to the um, ability to recognize the different size and shapes that must exist in these particles and how essential that heterogeneity is. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, all I can tell you is that in the types of knockouts that we've made, so when you take out the NDST1, sulfotransferase, what happens is you reduce the overall degree of sulfation and the size of the blocks decrease and their spacing increases, okay? Under those conditions, they don't bind anymore. When you take out the 2O sulfotransferase, which adds to the uronic acids, actually the cells compensate and they increase the level of N-sulfation and 6-sulfation so the block sizes actually get bigger, okay? They become more closely spaced now, yet you still have a gross deficiency in binding. The overall charge state within those regions is identical, okay? So in that case, it's probably that the, the docking depends on, on the orientation of that 2O sulfate group specifically, but not the arrangements of the sulfated segments. Now, I, you know, that's as good of an answer as I can give you because there's no way for us to control this um, in some systematic way. Jeff, do you think there's something about the transmembrane or cytoplasmic domain of Syndicon 1 that's unique that it allows internalization? No. I, well, maybe. I mean, that's a possibility. So we know that the, liver, the hepatocytes express Syndicon 4 at very high levels as well. Yet, um, when we make a Syndican 4 knockout mouse, it doesn't accumulate plasma lipids. If you cross the Syndican 1 to the Syndican 4, it doesn't accentuate it at all. 
So there's something about the location of syndicant 1, which, which we know is the, on, the, on the basal membrane. It could be that syndicant 4 is in the wrong location. Um, it could be that the cytoplasmic domain of syndicant 1 docks with adapter proteins or elements that are involved in a macropinocytotic process, and syndicant 4 doesn't do that. So I don't know the answer to that. I think we can start to get at some of these questions, though, by using our reconstitution system. So right now, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a better hepatoma cell. And so um, we're using Talon technology to knock out syndicant 1 in, in, in that cell line. And then we can put the adeno, use adenovirus to introduce the um, recombinant forms of syndicant 1, where we delete the cytoplasmic domain or any other part of the, of the molecule. And then we can do the parallel studies in vivo. That's all I can tell you at this point. Well, you described the role of the syndicant one in removing the lipoprotein particles. So the question I have is, what percentage of the atherosclerosis is because of the triglyceride versus cholesterol? So in the, in the case of, so that's, again, that's kind of a complicated question because the models that we have to use in order to induce atherosclerosis in the mouse, whether it be the LDL receptor knockout on a high fat diet, or an ApoE knockout just without a high-fat diet. Both of those cause accumulation of both cholesterol and triglycerides. So you don't get atherosclerotic lesions just because you have hypertriglyceridemia. You need to have cholesterol accumulation as well. That's well known. So what's happening in the system, I think, is just that the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins are contributing to the formation of the plaques. And you are using a Because you, you don't have higher levels of LDL when you take out the proteoglycan. It's only the, these remnant particles that accumulate. You are using radioactive retinal. I was wondering in what part of the lipoprotein the retinal is incorporated, whether it is representing a true lipoprotein particle. Uh, I think follow what you just said. You are using radioactive retinal in tracing the lipoprotein clearance. Yes. So where is this retinal localizing in the lipoprotein particle? Does oh. it represent a true marker for the lipoprotein clearance? Ah, I see. Um, generally, it's thought to be in the, in the core of the particle, because most of the, all the neutral lipids tend to, to accumulate in the core. There could be some stuck in the, in the, in the monolayer of lipid, but I, I suspect most of it's in the core of the particle. A very beautiful talk. I just am curious about some things that may be outside of the scope of your talk, but where, what do you see as being the origin of some of the differences in, where would your mechanism be sensitive to some of the differences that are seen in, for example, the degree of saturation of the lipids within the uh, particles, and B, the variants of APOE, each of which certainly give very different phenotypes. Yes. So in terms of ApoB, I mean, we've excluded, at least in the lipoprotein preparations that we work with, that the ApoB capacity to bind heparin has nothing to do with interactions with heparin sulfate. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't interact with heparin sulfate in other locations. And in fact, I think the deposition of things like LDL, for example, in the, in the arterial wall is mediated through ApoB to a large extent. Um, in terms of unsaturation of the lipid, so as you probably know, um, as you change lipid composition or you change the size of the particles, then there are different determinants of the apolipoproteins that become exposed, and that's been well documented using various monoclonal antibodies. So it could be that, in fact, when you change lipid composition or during the progressive degradation of particles, part of which probably takes place in the liver as well, that new determinants are coming up that wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily assess in our types of assays because we're always using plasma-based um, um, particles. So I can't exclude any other fact, you know, those kinds of things playing a role, but I, we would have to think of some very different way of doing the experiment than the way that uh, we're currently doing it. Last question. All right, terrific talk. Uh, quick question in relation to the structure of, I guess, syndicant 1. Um, is there any indication that the chondroitin sulfate, I guess, side chains present on it play a role? 
Um, in Syndicam 1? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we don't know that. So we have now a conditional knockout in, in the sulfotransfer is that puts the sulfate groups on the four position, the chondroitin sulfate chains. And so we can ask that question in the liver. We haven't done it yet, though. But I think the other way to do it is to use the adenoviral system, make mutations in those two attachment sites where the chondroitin ch chains are, then knock them back into a hepatoma line or knock it back into the liver. And then we can get at that question. Okay, well, uh, please uh, join us uh, at the reception, which follows in the usual place, uh, organized by FBAS, and join me in thanking uh, Dr. Esco for a very lovely talk.